Welcome everybody uh, to whatever talk. Um, this is just <laughs> volleyball talk, not the dig. But before we get started, if you want to learn more about Dustin, I actually interviewed him earlier during the year from the dig, which was my YouTube show. And so for those of you who are logging into the IG live, sorry if I'm not looking at the screen because I'm actually recording this on Zoom and I'll be posting it later on my YouTube channel. So it's not like I'm ignoring you, <laughs> but we will be taking questions from the live feed. So feel free to ask them. And then Dustin's also going to look through some and, and choose some to answer on his own. But we're just going to talk volleyball for an hour and, and see where this goes. So maybe we'll break the ice with uh, what you've been up to. I know a lot of people are kind of curious with all the pro seasons ending. So if you can share with us what you've been up to, Dustin. Yeah. Uh, what a wild ride, right? <laughs> and uh, like we were talking about before, it's like, uh, you know, you got to practice what you preach. It's just like, <laughs> there's a certain amount of surrender and there's a certain amount of, all right, what's in front of me? Like, what, what can I actually do right now to elicit change, to make sure uh, – I'm doing the right things. I'm taking the right steps. And for me, since volleyball got canceled, um, I was able to go home. I stayed an extra week in Poland after the season was canceled. I stayed with my girlfriend there. It was great. I worked on this. Uh, I worked and completed this uh, seven-day passing course. Uh, I have, like, you can find it on noisybuckets.com. It's, like, free email. And if you want to go further, I think the best way to learn, or I know the best way to learn is from video. And so – you can buy the video series. And so I was finishing that easy. You know, I was loving Poland, loving spending time with my girlfriend. Came back to California and uh, she's like, you know, what do I do right now? It's like, can't really lift, can't train, not really know what's going on. And so I just started Zooming. I just got into the Zoom craze and I started reaching out to, uh, to as many clubs as I could find. At the same time, I kind of did like a USA takeover and a lot of clubs started reaching out to me. Initially, it was like uh, just kind of talking about passing, right? I would share my screen. And we'd go over like Genia. We'd go over Eric. Go over Zatorski. Some amazing liberos. But they all play the game a little differently. And just seeing, you know, being curious, like, what can we learn from them? What things resonate with us as pastors? You know, do we want to be, like, all over the place? Do we want to be simple? Different ways to create space. And, uh it was really rewarding, especially for me when I was creating this course, I was like passing the best I've ever passed in my life yeah. just because I'm, I was just learning so much from so many great liberos. Um, so doing that. And then uh, as I was doing that, a couple coaches started reaching out to me and they're like, Hey, well, uh, we'll like pay you if you want to come and zoom with our team, like do like a mindfulness. And I'm like, yeah, I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been connecting a lot with uh, colleges. I just connected with uh, an old teammate, John Winder, who's now coaching at Fresno State. That was a really cool discussion. And I don't know, like, I guess, I don't know how to say this about being arrogant, but I'm, I'm like pleasantly surprised. Like uh, people that read stuff I write and like people that follow me because every coach I talk to, they're like, Oh, we have a couple girls that follow you. We have a couple guys. Yeah. The D one coach, G three coach reached out to me today. And he's like, our whole team follows you. A lot of them comment. And it's just like, it's like a uh, very surprising, like in a good way. And not just that, but I can be of service and we can have this dialogue. And uh, the big thing for me is not necessarily sharing my successes because you know, it's easy, but and it really doesn't give anything back, but it's just like, hey, here's where I failed. Here's where I had setbacks. This is what I did when I had roadblocks. And like, this is how we should actually look at failure. Failure is great. You know, like the best moments in my life have come after failure. And so just kind of refocusing like uh, and bringing some like stoic philosophy back into it. A more fati, you know, something that's really good this time to love one's fate. Like, because it's so easy to be resentful, right? this isn't fair. This isn't right. I want to play volleyball. Get me out of my house. Like these things don't help us, right? They do not help us. They're natural. They're natural for sure. But if we're conscious, we can realize that these things don't help us. And we can realize that we can be open and creative finding different things. And so for me, it's kind of gone to the zoom. Um, today I will finish the digging course. There's been such great feedback on the passing course that I've done a digging course. And so that's just been a grind, but, uh, you know, I think it's, there's going to be a, a lot of value. And so I've been happy grinding away. And then I can't say too much, but I'm teaming up with some really 
uh, we didn't speak about this before. I'm teaming up with some really uh, great coaches, some amazing athletes, and we're going to be presenting an online camp coming soon. And this is something that uh, is really fascinating because it's, it's not just going to be for quarantine. It's going to be something that's going to be around for years to come. So yeah. uh, we're just getting finalized on this. And I think maybe on Monday it will be open for people to register too. But uh, I'm really excited about this. This is, I mean, again, you know, who knows, you know, once the stuff blows over, but again, it's like when we're in this situation, it's like, what active steps can we take? And uh, the goal for me is just to be as of much value to the volleyball community. And I feel it's almost my responsibility because my story is just like, I wasn't really that great of a volleyball player. And sometimes people are like, Oh, you're, you're so tough and like so resilient. And the thing for me, it was like, I was so afraid. I did, I didn't want to lose my job. I didn't want to not be team USA Destin Watt. And I did not want to be, you know, Oh, oh, Dustin was good, but he, he couldn't get a pro contract. I was like so afraid that I made these decisions, right? Decisions yeah. to meditate, decisions to journal, to start reading more. You know, all these things I acted on fear. But you know what? It worked out. But the younger generations, you don't have to act on fear, but I can, you can still have this information or these toolboxes to allow you to train with more precision, more intention, and therefore leaving you more prepared and more confident on the court, especially more uh, resilient and in the face of uh, failures. That's the biggest thing I'm getting. Yeah. You know, everyone wants to know what can I do when they're anxious on the court? What can I do when they're stressed on the court? What can I do when they're pressured on the court? Because we can all play good when everything's easy, but yeah. what are the tools we can use when things get tough and to balance out of that? And to play the game with joy and love because that's how it's supposed to be, not with mm-hmm. fear. Yeah, it's going back to the BB Mindset interview where you talked about gratitude. And even before you even talked about gratitude, you just took a deep breath and even took in that moment of gratitude yeah. before you even spoke about it. Uh, and also, I mean, if you guys, yeah. so, go ahead. It's just so easy to to buy into the the lack or the scarcity, right? We have a choice. Yeah. And if you guys want to learn more about some of the camps and courses that he's offering, I'll be including those links in the description box when the video is posted. So uh, make sure yeah, it'll be out. That. It'll be out. Oh man, I'm so excited. I wish. Yeah, I was talking a little bit with the with the coaches I'm running it with today, but we had to be a little rushed, and I was like, hey, I'm going to speak with Tony. What should I say? And they're like, Ah, you know. But it's 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 going to be. I think it's going to be of a lot of value to people. And that's why I'm really excited because, uh, yeah, it's going to be great. I, I can't say a lot. Dang, it sucks. But it's going to be, uh, it's going to be really great. I'm really excited to, to be able to work with the people I'm going to work with. Okay. That's awesome. Sorry, real quick. Um, my wife, who's actually tuned in, is kind of making sure this is going okay. She says there's some bad echo. Is, do you hear anything on yours end, Dustin? Yeah, I get an echo when you talk. Okay. Yeah. My wife said it's better. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, someone says, I love you so much. You're the reason why I started playing volleyball. I love you. <laughs> That's a Maybe great talking to you. <laughs> All right. So first question, I have no experience playing in high school or for club. And this is from that damn earth. Is it possible <laughs> for me to play division one? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's possible. I mean, it's always, uh, I don't know. I think, I think the big thing is belief, right? If you have it, there's a possibility. If you don't have it, then it's clear, you know, it's, that's the only time it's going to be a hundred percent. But, um, yeah, the big thing I'm now, you know, trying to connect with athletes, it's just like, there's always a, a better way. You can always put more time. You can always work with a little more intention. You can always be more mindful. You always have the ability, the option to get extra reps. And so uh, the big thing is belief. You have to have it, right? And sometimes it can come from within. And sometimes it really helps to hear it from outside you. I was just talking the other day with uh, Matt Furbringer. And uh, uh, I spent, you know, five years, I think, with Team USA. And that, at the end of that fifth year, I still wasn't even training. And I was just, like, so bummed. I'm just, like, it's not working out. Nothing's working out. And he was like, Hey, good things happen to good people. And it just like, it just lifted me up so high. 
Um, and so, I don't know. The big thing is just belief. You have to believe. And after that belief, you have to put in the work, intentional work, right? Uh, a lot of people are like, what drill can I do? And it's like, you know, drills can help like at home. But I think the real value is learning about journaling, learning about meditation, starting to read some books about mindset, about sports psychology, starting to study film. That's, that's why I created the, the, the video course is because people kept on asking me, you know, when I would share like on stories, like watching Verboff or watching Sergio. And it's like, yeah, this is what I do. 30 minutes to an hour a day. I, I watch this. And everyone's like, oh, how can I watch it? I can't. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, you don't have volumetrics. And so you can't. <laughs> and so that's kind of why I made it. And just to give people the opportunity to be able to study. And so there's a lot of different ways. It's just we have to be more uh, intentional with how we're using our time. And I, I like, you know, talking about there's a lot of people that are ready to run through the wall, but with less time, we can go over the wall. Mm. That's a great analogy. Something I'll add to that, too, is uh, making time for yourself. And that can be applied to so many other areas. But I think oftentimes, especially in our modern society, we want to schedule things and we schedule things that things that we do instead of and we want to make sure we carve out time for ourselves just to be present just to let our 100%. thoughts run its course. And some of the best ideas come from boredom. And boredom often has a negative association, right? We kind of sit there and stare at the wall. But some of our aha moments when we're just sitting there at the bus stop or staring, putting our socks on, it's like, oh, shoot, I just had a great idea. And mm -hmm. I think our brain is trying to tell us something and unlock our talent, but we're always stuffing it with things that we're trying to do versus just being mindful and present in the moment and carving out times for ourselves. 100% Eckhart Tolle talks about this a lot, this uh, belief that we should be doing and this rejection of being where being is like who we truly are. We're always like, I have to do this, I have to do that, do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, especially now we're just like, even though we have so much time, there's just so much stimulus now because now we're so often on Facebook or on Instagram. Yeah. And now it's just like, do, 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 do. And we don't have that time where we can just be, just mm -hmm. decompress. Or even now too, I think now is an important time. And I'm saying this as a suggestion to myself as well, where it's like, sit, journal, where am I right now? Where am I in my life? Where, what am I afraid of? What am I feeling good about? Where do I believe I can be? And what's going to take for me to get there? And like we were talking about last time we spoke with Josh, I had that reflection around maybe June, July last year. And it was just, it was the most powerful thing. It was like, you know what? not feeling so good about my game right now, but I believe in myself. And with that belief, I needed to create some steps to, to work intentionally. And I had like one of my best training blocks, if you would say, and it worked out great. But I think it's really important to sit by yourself. And like you said, have that beingness where either you close your eyes and you meditate or you just get those thoughts out into uh, paper and journal. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to... Uh, this is a great question. Uh, someone said, you're, you're a beast. <laughs> KevRod22 says, how do you deal with hard losses? Yeah. I, so, okay, there's a lot we, I can go on here. And uh, what I've been speaking with, like club teams, is journaling. Journaling is the biggest thing. Um, but as we're going to have a lot of questions, the, the easy, like, kind of hack. I know everyone loves hacks. I have this sticky on my wall and I don't know how I, how I came up with this idea. It wasn't like mine. I probably read it from a book somewhere. I don't know how I came up with it, but it's the best thing ever. It's so simple. It just says, this is good because dot, dot, dot. So after a hard game, this is good because and you have to answer it. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like having this shadow of like failure or shame or anxiety or just feeling worthless, now it's like you go back home and you're like you're able to erase everything by answering this question. This is good because you know what? I need to I can develop, you know, more technique on my reception. This is good because, you know, I haven't been working that hard. I'm going to get to the gym every day 30 minutes before training. This is good because uh I was anxious today and I realized I need to be meditating more. This is good because I was up late all week and I was pretty tired and I didn't get good workouts in. So I'm going to focus more on sleep. And so it's like, boom, it's like solution. Like we're, we're, we're being honest with ourselves. Like something didn't go well. 
right? Something didn't go well, something was challenging. We got tested and we didn't do great, but we're gonna find a solution rather than just like allowing this external circumstance that we have nothing to do, right? We'd have no control over, allowing it to dictate how we feel or even more importantly, how, we're, how we act. Yeah. Awesome, man, I'm gonna steal that one. That's great. I never even thought about phrasing it as this is my premise, this is my starting point, regardless of what happened today, my starting point is this is good because dot, dot, dot. And that's it's cool. amazing. I, I, and I'm sure for you, it's like the biggest epiphanies in life have come from like the biggest failures or like mm -hmm. when you're like butts on fire and you're like, what do I do? And like you, you go deep down inside of you and you're like, and you like kind of rise kind of like the story of like the Phoenix, right? You know, you go down and you come out like that much larger. And so we have to, we have to be like honest with ourselves and be, you know, conscious and mindful that we're going to fail no matter what we do in life we're gonna fail and in those failures we will learn the most about ourselves like mm -hmm. every season for me has been like pretty difficult if not like really hard this last season was like the best season ever and i also had one other season where it was like the best season ever but you know what in those best season ever i didn't learn a lot about myself because i wasn't put in a stressful challenging situation where i'm just like I have, to, I have to find a way to be better. I have to find a way to be way more intentional. I have to find a way to be more mindful. Like I have to figure something out. What I'm doing is not working. And like, I have to dig within or maybe like find a book, find a mentor and go even larger and grander than I even thought I was capable of. Yeah. All right. Loving your positivity. My wife said, Dustin is vegan now and can't have pho with you. <laughs> There's vegan pho. There's really good vegan pho. That's right. <laughs> you went vegan. Actually, I think there was a vegan question. Um, you know what? Maybe we can just kind of go on that tangent and you can share with your fans uh, about why you went vegan. So if you guys remember from our first talk, we talked, we, we were dreaming about doing a, a talk, a chat session <laughs> over a nice hot bowl of pho and he was playing. Yeah, cold I got to come up. <laughs> that's on me i i gotta come up to norcal what what city are you in again uh, union city which is 40 minutes south of san francisco so it's a suburb uh, pretty close to there uh, and then 20 minutes north of san jose so those are the two major cities or actually you'll are know you stanford. close 15 is, is that uh, 20 minutes name? from stanford <laughs> okay i was talking with this uh there's a club up there that taylor gregory coaches with i think it's by in san jose is that right there's a lot, yeah, a lot of clubs in San Jose you know area. That? There's Bay to Bay. There's a boys or girls club. It's a girls. I, I think it's Elevate. Is it Elevate? I don't. I don't know any. There's Encore. Um, that's a big one. There's Eclipse. Uh, N Line. Hmm. Yeah, I'll figure Santa, it out. But a lot of people refer to San Jose as an area. Just kind of like people, people say L A area. Within San Jose, there's a lot of neighboring cities that people still kind of refer to as the San Jose South Bay area. So I wonder if it's uh -huh. unique to, to San Jose. I forget the name, but like what they're doing over there is amazing. They have like a foundation for, for kids that, you know, have a little uh, tougher life and they just provide this huge facility for them to be, to do art, to do sports, to learn how to cook. So oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they're one of the clubs I'm going to probably speak with on Zoom, but I, I really want to actually go up there and meet them because what they're doing, I think, is so amazing. Arguably, yeah. something that I want to do in my, in my life. I think so. their facility is called the Foundry. The Foundry, and then from that club, they, uh, the Encore practices out of that. But yeah, the Foundry is yeah. a local near Redwood City. Yeah, they have, like a, they have a, a, a sound room for people to DJ and rap and record. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yep, that's the place. Yeah, yeah. So I gotta get up. Is that is that pretty close to you? I mean, under an hour. Yes, that's yeah, under an hour for sure. That's gonna be Redwood City, so it's only twenty thirty minutes. So it's pretty close. Yeah, man, we gotta get that pho. I lo I love pho <laughs> so much. Like, even on a hot day, I like torture myself. <laughs> Dude, you know what's funny is uh, I made a comment because in the winter time, that's when I especially love pho. Right, it's cold, and I commented to one of my pho yeah. buddies. And I said, oh, man, it just feels like pho weather. And she said, wait, isn't it humid in Vietnam all the time? Isn't it hot weather, pho weather? I was like, okay, you're right. 
All right. J Du Wang 42 asks, I'm supposed to have my first volleyball game next year. How do I deal with nervousness and concentration? Yeah, so that's a big question. It's the question I get the most right now. Uh, long answer, you know, meditation practice. Short answer, do the best you can to, to come back to the to breath. <sighs> Move our consciousness away from the thoughts. Most of these are, you know, negative thoughts. If, if not, you know, we're catastrophizing. You know, it's like uh, maybe having a bad pass. You know, now the thoughts are, I suck. I always do this. I'm always blowing the game. I'm going to get taken out. I'm not going to start. A college coach is not going to take me. You know, we start catastrophizing. So the quicker we're able to detach from our thoughts, and I think the easiest thing for me is just putting the awareness of the sensation of the breath going in out the nose. Easy. Yeah. And there's uh, Dustin talks more about that in detail about the rest of breath and uh, uh, utilizing some of the VB mindsetter techniques. So yeah. there's that video. And I've, I've, I've done that for myself, um, just taking a breath. And I've learned that from Dustin has helped, helped me so much. Steven650 asks, how can you be comfortable with rolling or diving? And how do you read hitters like an outside, whether they're going to hit cross or line? So it looks like two questions. Yeah, I got this. I'm, I talk about both of these things on the digging course I'm coming up with. But a spoiler, for me, the big thing is just line of approach, right? Where their shoulders are. So when they're going to come around, like you can kind of notice like they're going to come around here. So kind of line up on the shoulder and knowing that there's a possibility, you know, they can kind of come back, they can come cross body, they can tip, they can do whatever. Right. But we just want to get in that line. So their hardest ball, like we're lining up on. And then uh, with diving, it's just practice. Um, I do have a, I'm going to be talking a lot about this on day seven of the digging course that uh, will be out. I think next week it'll be done or it will be out. It'll be done today. It'll be out next week. Um, but the big thing is just, it's just practice learning how to do it. Like most of my career I was spent diving wrong. Uh, but you know, younger kids now they are just picking it up. You just, you just need practice. And I think it helps a lot watching really good players because the coach can tell you how to do it, but you're like, ah, oh, what? I don't like, cause you, now you start moving your consciousness around and you get tight. But if you watch someone do it, you're much more likely to be able to do it right. Mm. Great advice. Nice. A lot of people just saying hi. <laughs> All right. Maury Felice asks, what platform do you both use to pass? My arms create some sort of triangle angle with the traditional form and the ball hits my bone more rather than the flat part of my arm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The big thing for me is just, Arms out here, see what my tippy toes, arms out here and just put in. And if our platform really isn't uh, touching, the one thing I like to do is like um, when I was younger, when I watched TV, I just put my arms in between my legs and just squeeze and it just naturally puts it together. Uh, there's obviously going to be some pain when you first start learning how to play volleyball, but it kind of recedes slowly away. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I do that when I watch TV too. I thought I was the only one. And my wife always says, stop thinking about volleyball. We're watching TV. <laughs> it works. It works so well. All right. No, this is a great question. Charles L. Zhang, how do you deal with teammates who can't believe they can win even against stacked teams? Uh, I think the big thing is you have to put yourself where they're coming from. And it's obviously not a place of confidence, of security. It's going to be because they're insecure, they're nervous, they're anxious. And so the, the best thing not to do is to judge them. Like, why aren't you doing this? You know, the best thing is to be like, come on, we can do this, you know? And, you know, I think a lot of the trust is built outside of the court. You know, you can maybe have a player who's just like amazing on the court, amazing character. And he can lead on the court and just on the court. But I think a lot of that comes off the court too, just being sincere and genuine in times where uh, it isn't like, if you do something, I'll also benefit. It's just like being sincere and genuine in times where um, people aren't looking to get anything back. And then in those times on the court, then you can lead, right? Be like, speak up in the huddle say we got this bring guys tight i like putting my arm over guys you see that with kavika shoji does a really good job leading guys puts his arm over it like come on man we got this you know or like sometimes like when the guys have success maybe they're doubting themselves 
Um, I played it for a guy this year. He had always been like the third outside. Never been a starter in the Plus Liga. And there's some times you can see he's like really doubting himself or like in the past. But when he did get a kill, I like push him and be like, yeah, like you're the freaking man. And he's like, yeah, I am, you know. And so <laughs> just kind of shake, shaking guys up in some way, right? You got you to gotta shake them up. You got to move them. And, uh, but the big thing for me is uh, having that compassion for them, having that love because uh, it's, it's fear, right? It's fear. It's insecurity. It's, they want to win, but they, something inside of them like, is holding them back. Yeah. And I think also going back to playing free, and you've touched upon this so many times, especially people who are playing professionally. Like I, if, when, when I've talked to a lot of pro players, that everyone there's a general vibe in, in, in the European volleyball circuit where everyone's kind of playing not to lose their contract. Yes. And that can feel very result-oriented. Um, but if you let go of that, and I know it's easy for me to say because I don't play professional European volleyball, but <laughs> I've just seen it so much on the court and even in my own performance. Like if you really just let go of the result and encourage more process-oriented orient, things with your teammates because they will make mistakes, they will hesitate, they will hit out. But just like Dustin goes with pumping them up, it's like, oh, man, that was such an aggressive swing, man. Do that again. Or if they get blocked, even though they should have hit around or whatever, you instead of saying, dude, got to hit around the block, you say, oh, I got you covered. Stay aggressive. I got you. Like, yes. just go for it, right? Yeah. So encourage the process and, and support them that way to encourage them to be versus always waiting for the, a good result to encourage a good uh, cheer, for example. Yeah. And, then, yeah, the perfect teammate – is like wholly, fully bodied in the growth mindset, right? But it's so difficult because you know what? Parents, parents are doing the best they can, right? But when your son or daughter wins, you're like, you're like, yeah, you're a winner. Like, I love you. And when you lose, you're like, oh, oh, so sorry. And the kid gauges that, right? Now it's just like this duality. Or it's like, I win and they, they're so happy and they love me. And I lose, they're like, oh, you know. And so there's like a duality just by them reacting. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough. We get crushed. We got crushed and thrown into that fixed mindset from a young age where if we win, there's something as a different reaction. If we lose, there's a different reaction. I was lucky. My parents would always say, we're proud how you competed. Win or lose, if I competed well, we're proud how you competed. Of course, there was a lot of times where I didn't compete. I was like the kid on the beach, like kicking balls, like saying the C word. I, sometimes I was not very good. And again, that comes by, back to like me being insecure, right? Because I wanted to win so bad that like I couldn't like uh, handle my emotions. And so people like that, it's, they, they're doing their best, but they just don't have any space to, to really decide how they want to respond. And so yeah. even with kids where you like look at them, you're like, I can't believe that. Or like, how could you do something? It's like offer them compassion. And you know what? You can, you can help them correct it correct themselves without making them wrong right that's the big thing because now it's the egos in play you can correct them without making them wrong yeah you know i so next week spoiler alert, i'm actually uh, interviewing reed pretty next tuesday and he's going to be on the dig the legend and in preparation for the interview i i'm rereading his book max potential which is a free ebook he offered like three or four years ago it's amazing and he exactly what he touched upon for the parents he said one, one big mind-opening uh, philosophy change he went through leading up to the 08 Gold Medal Olympics was trying to focus more on behaviors and outcomes. And he sees that in youth volleyball and in coaches and parents, but particularly, he says it's really important for parents to praise behaviors and choices more than the outcomes themselves. Like competing hard, you know, if you go for a ball, and you put all that effort, but you still missed it. It's like, you should be encouraging that, you know, don't go, Oh, you missed it. Like, Oh man, great dive. hundred you know, percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Reads the man. Yeah. Anything, anything we has to say, I'm, I'm behind. What if he says, stop going vegan, go back to eating beef. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, how do you change a bad mechanic like approach steps, arm swing, and snap into a good one after your body and mind adapted to it? <laughs> Ask Isaac Nubel. He's the man. Have you spoke with Isaac Nubel yet? I have not. Who's that? Uh, Torque VB. Oh, okay. Yeah. I follow you know him. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you want to make the connection, he's great. I just uh, hung out with him the other day. 
the place I'm staying at right now, it's like I have a little rooftop that I can overlook the ocean. Oh, and I was just like, I was like, come up, man, we'll watch the sunset. Because we, we played on uh, my first year in the national team. We played on the same team. We were both Liberos. Uh, but what a what a great guy! I played with him a couple, actually a couple of open nationals for Team Paul Mitchell back in the day. Uh, but uh, he's just, you know, just everything everything he's doing right now is just learning to understand the arm swing better. And the content he's putting out is just like unbelievable. I don't think there's anyone even close to him in the volleyball world at, at least that's putting out public content. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome breaking it down and the science, but also the demos. He's he's got a whip of a body. Yeah. N or Neom asks, how do you mentally deal with intimidating players? Intimidating players. Yeah. I mean, it's something that you can't control, right? If anything, if there's someone that's intimidating, it should be uh, a welcoming challenge, right? I create, I get to play against someone that, you know, is putting me in a stressful environment in that stressful environment. I will grow. Great. I love it. Let's do it. You know, because I mean, as you move up the ladders, like the more, the more you grow, you know, the closer you get to the finals, it's going to be more stressful. And so when you play athletes like that, great. It's like a great way to prep yourself. Yeah. This is a cool question. Bricer Ice asks, how high is your jumping reach? Uh, you know what? Back in the day, it was like, uh, what is it? basketball basketball hoop is 12 feet wait 10. The, 10. the rim is sorry 10, not yeah. 12 not 12 uh i think i was like 10 10 5 there was like a for a while where i was doing like the like the jack 3d you remember that like pre-workout stuff no i don't jack it was like this like it was like this pre-workout stuff that they found that was giving a bunch of people like heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so like our, our trainer for USA volleyball was like, you guys have to stop taking this like, <laughs> no more. But when I was taking that, I was like able to go up with two hands and like hanging on the rim. And I'm just oh, like, ah, oh. but uh, I couldn't, I couldn't dunk, but I could hang. So like, I was like 10, five, maybe. All right. That's, that's still really explosive. That's still a 30 plus vertical for sure. Yeah, I, I was so surprised. The power of crazy drugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are the main things to look for when reading a hitter? And this is from Kyle Trong. The big thing, body. Body for me. Body is everything. And then see if you can get a, like a, just a pick up on the elbow. Something I still kind of have a hard time at. But like if, if there's something different in the elbow, if it kind of goes up or it just isn't getting back, right? So it just kind of stays here and see if you can pick it up. I think, you know, a lot of coaches are like, okay, stay balanced. You can move and still be balanced in my opinion. Right. I think you, you can still move and be balanced or I'm moving. And if I have to adjust, I can be back here, but there's sometimes we're stuck. If we're not moving at all and we're not balanced. And of course, mm -hmm. if we're moving, there's a possibility we can't be balanced. So, yeah, but I think once you, once you're able to get those cues, especially if you're a, a wing digger, just, just go, just go and get the tip. Steven 650 asks, uh, how do you increase your reaction time? Because at open gyms, there's sometimes on the opposing team, a hitter that hits really fast. Like I, when I blink, I can't even pass it. Yeah. Arms out, right? Arms out, arms out, arms out. Let's see if I can show. So the big thing for me, um, when we're digging, right, everyone thinks it's like legs, like I need to be low. But for me, it's like my chest is up and like my hips are forward. And then with that, or sorry, our hips are back. And with that, like our arms are naturally going to extend outside of our body, right? Boom. And so when we can give ourselves this natural foundation where our arms just extend out, we really don't have to react, right? If it hits our arms, it's just going to go straight up. Times we get in trouble if we're like leaning over and our arms are going to be down the perpendicular to the floor so if it hits our arms we don't have any time to move it's going to shoot either into the net or under the net so just okay, finding so. a position with your arms mm -hmm. or with your body i usually i like you know uh, hips back chest up and then our arms will kind of so, like naturally present itself horizontal to the floor mm -hmm. so on a side question i noticed that your your digging posture was unique about it. you're a lot more upright it seems compared to other defenders that i've seen so how do you deal with the balls that are slightly in front of your knees like or a couple of feet in front where if I'm upright, 
I, I imagine it might be challenging to have to lean forward to, to get under that one. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so, I mean, it's kind of like a calculated risk where um, guys that are a little more higher, who are just playing for balls that, you know, are in this. And if it's a shot, it's just something that you just like full on sprawl for, right? They hit it down. It's like, all right, you know, it's going to be a kill. But it's the thought too, or it's like, well, what are you going to do? Like, you know, if it's just one block, are you going to step up or are you going to stay? And so the thing for me is like when I'm digging balls higher here, I'm just kind of cutting off the angles more rather than being deep in the corner and be able to get balls in front of me. By stepping up, I'm cutting off more angles and taking okay. a more, much more area of the court. Okay. So your philosophy is maybe move forward a little bit more than what traditionally are people taught. So you can cut off more of the depth of the angle, but then be close enough to still go for some of the shorter balls. So your whole body is a platform and taking up more space. Yeah, that yeah, way. yeah. I, okay. I love digging. Uh, one, I think it's day six. I talk about digging, digging balls above our chest and how we can be creative here, here, and of course, higher. All right. This is a general question. Curly JFC asks thoughts on a hybrid serve. The best. I think everyone should do it. Awesome. It's, it's, you're seeing what Mike can do, but I think especially for float servers, right? Float servers usually don't have the best arms, right? But what they can do is you'll see a lot of professional athletes and then younger players too, they're just going to go all hands, right? So they stay with their hands and then if it's spun, now they're deep or they're really far inside the court. Now they're getting like caught here. And yeah. so it just messes with the passers because now the servers are one step ahead of the passers where maybe the passers like, all right, this is where I like to be on float serves. This is where I like to be on jump serves, you know, vice versa. And then when you have the hybrid, the passers are like in a weird spot, like I, I'll find the halfway for where I want to be. And so automatically the passers aren't as comfortable as they usually are. And so this is why I think you're seeing Micah and Taylor do it even though they have great jump serves because they put the passers in a weird position. That's true. Uh, Mitch uh, Mitchell, I forgot the full name of the middle, the young middle from UCLA. Mitch Stahl. Um, Mitch Stahl, he's got like a heavy, like a two-hand toss heavy. It's like, not like a true top spin. And then one of the middles from Poland, uh, it's like just a bunch of consonants. I can't even pronounce the, pronounce the names, but BNX. he's a – BNX. Uh, he, he, I went to watch him in BNL maybe two or three years ago. He went on a run of like four or five aces. Yep. It's coming from what, okay. six, 11, seven feet, a lot of pace yeah. and almost no spin. And you, you don't know what he's going to do. You know, a lot of guys like on flow serves are going to go with their hands, but now they have to stay back and they have to pass closer with their platform, which they never do. And so mm -hmm. I think if you can hybrid, 100% do it. Got it. Who's the funniest team on team? Who's the funniest on team USA? Ask Kyle Trump. Uh, <laughs> Other than Dustin. Jeff, Je <laughs> Jeff Jendrick is, is funny uh, just cause he has like the pierce of heart and he's just so young. Um, but for sure, Taylor Averill, Max Holt. I think if you put, you put those guys in a room, I mean, they're, they're going to, kill you for days of laughter they're, they, they were supposed to start a podcast last year i don't know what happened with that but uh i, I think both those guys are going to end up in hollywood in some sort of <laughs> way whether like writing acting something like that like they're both like it's unbelievable like how funny how charismatic how witty they are and so i'm excited i'm really excited to see what uh what max will do after volleyball because yeah, i think he's really talented He's a guitar player too. I see a lot of images of him singing and playing. He's a guitar player, and his cousin is a is already kind of a established writer in in um, Hollywood for musicians. Wow. And so I think he's probably going to go that path too. We'll see. He's, he's he's both him and Taylor are really really smart, really talented, and I, I think they're going to be successful in whatever they do. Good for him. May six one eight asked, "Is there any pro pro players that are five nine? And I don't mean the barrel. Uh, yeah, yeah. I played with one in Finland. I think he was five, five ten, five eleven. The short Cuban guy, and he had like a forty-five inch vert, and he was like the best player in Finland for like ten years. He was a stud. I mean, the yeah, it's definitely going to be harder, right? But you know what? The most important thing in volleyball 
is being a good ball control player. That will get you places. If you can pass that times, if you dig everything, add a system, you can set balls, and you don't make errors, you don't get blocked, one-on-one -on -one you put balls away, like, you're going to find a team, right? But everyone just puts too much stock into, like, how big I am or whatever. Kubiak's, like, what, 6'3", and he's the best player in the world, best outside here in the world. So it's, like, you know, just four or five inches shorter, I think you could play pro ball. Yeah. But, uh, Louis, again, Kubiak does – he does all those skills perfect. Mm -hmm. Ruiz, I forgot his first name. There's a guy in, on, in the Spanish League. He They qualified for the Champions League one year. I remember watching him, and he's only 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 but monster vertical and smart player. He's got the, all the chip shots in the world. That's usually tend to how they be successful. Although Kubiak <laughs> just hits the crap out of the ball. He's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I grew up in the, the Cambodian volleyball scene. We had two oh, yeah. guys, the Pokes, and they were five, like five, three, and five, four. And they were both uh, three year starters on our varsity team as outside hitters. Just freaking sweet, man. So if you can do the other skills, like you can find a way to get on the court. And if not, there's always nine, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you can be a star <laughs> nine, man. <laughs> I, want, I need to go see one of those games so bad. Oh, like so I'll let fun. you know. You would love nationals. You'd one. Not only would you have a ton of fans, you would have great people are just going to be stuffing you with food. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, of, I could do that. A lot of great, uh, and then there's just open course. Just do stuff. You just see these little kids playing too on the side, and it, it's just a great environment. It's definitely more than just the volleyball itself. But uh, I think this year, gosh, were we in Toronto last year? I think this year is supposed to be in Chicago. It's back in the mainland, but I'll definitely let you know, and I'll let you know where it is in case you want to come out. Yeah. That, that'd be awesome to have uh, you out. Did you – Paul Paul Lotman met his wife there. Yeah, Paul Lotman. Paul, Paul Lotman has a little Asian, a little Indonesian. So is, oh, I thought he was part Cambodian. Is it in Indonesian? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I remember – so he came to the L.A. Nine Man Nationals, and I remember watching in the park, and I was just eating, and then I just see this ball, like there's this – tall building maybe eight ten story building that there's a backdrop <laughs> yeah. and i just see the ball bounce almost halfway to the top i'm like who the hell is that you know <laughs> everyone's trying to everyone's got some pretty pretty impressive hops and bounces um, yeah everyone has a the there and i went over there and i said who is this guy it's like oh shit it's paul lotman and then that's when <laughs> yeah. everyone's like yeah he's part asian blah 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 and i was like oh man but that, it was uh, the wong brothers kevin and scott wong did you know that yeah name? yeah yeah Kevin yeah. Wong is the freaking man. I'm trying to get the one day get the Shoji brothers out here. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think they're gonna go for top dollar. <laughs> oh, dude, we got if they can have a team with Micah Kavika, like both the Shoji brothers, um, or Mike Christensen, he's got to be part part Asian. He's got yeah. that mixed look. All right, this is a <laughs> cool question. Bryser Ice asks. Have you went against Japan specifically against Nishida Yuji? No, man. That guy's such a freaking baller. I'm a, that's the lefty, right? The I, lefty I think, bomb. Yeah, I've watched so much video of him. Uh, doing the, the digging course, I did a, a lot. I got a lot of clips from the Japanese team because obviously, yeah. you know, they, they dig everything, especially uh, I really like this libero Koga that played in Poland the last three years. So I was watching a lot of video of him uh, creating this digging course, but man, he's a, he's nasty, huh? That's, he's a fun guy to watch. I hope his career is able to last just because what he does to his arm and his body landing. So I'm hoping he has a long career. Yeah. And what people don't understand about smaller players is that they, to, to generate the same force as some of the big guys, they have to exert a lot more effort and the more force you put out the more force is going to come back on you in both the landing the contacts of the ball and it's really hard to to have people that size with that much force you know have a long lasting career so mm -hmm. yeah i agree I, I really hope i would love to watch him for a while um, ishikawa in the beginning of his career he had some funky landing mechanics where he's landing twisted on one leg i'm glad he eventually corrected that but that's another guy that also hit from japan um, He's awesome. Have you ever dug? You, I'm sure you've dug against them in the World Cup and some other competitions. Uh, I didn't play against Japan in the World Cup, unfortunately. Uh, no, I never played against. I wish I could play because, man, those games are freaking lit. Like uh, all the 
all the fans come out, especially like Japan versus USA or Japan versus Brazil over there. Like it's yeah. an amazing environment. Yeah. And it's cool to see him play in Italy, tearing it up there too with uh, uh, Hernandez, the lefty Cuban. And I think they also had Maruf. It was a, it was a pretty cool, t- it was a team of short guys. And yeah. was only six five. Ishikawa six what one two and Maruf. It's definitely a short team. What's the best spike you've ever seen? Uh, probably. I think Muse is up there. Muse is like a six nine lefty from Poland that jumps like forty two inches. He played in Russia this year. Supposedly he touches 12-6. I don't oh. know if that's true, but supposedly. Um, so there's him. You know, Ben's done some amazing stuff. I think Taylor. Yeah. In 2017, we played Poland in the last game of group play for, um, I think it was still World League at the time. And we had to win. We lost Ben, we didn't have Matt, we didn't have Max. I don't think we had Aaron or Jayski. And Taylor was hurt before the game. And like everyone would have been fine to be like if Taylor didn't play. But like Taylor like manned up and balled for us. And that game, like always, Kubiak was like talking some ish. And <laughs> you know, it's like when you talk, you talk that stuff to Taylor, like you're gonna fire him up. So one time, I think it was, I think they were in row one, and they didn't side out, and we got the transition, and Taylor went up and balanced the line, and it was just like, it's just like everyone's on the bench, just like, oh my god, <laughs> like because we had we had to win that game in three or four, and then uh, Argentina had to beat Bulgaria for us to get to the final six, and everything worked out. It was amazing. We could not believe we beat, like, Poland had their guys. They had their yeah. guys in Poland. And we had five of our guys hurt, and we won, in, I think, in four. But I remember Taylor that just, play. Oh, man, guys. Was, was it the no-look line? Like, they gave him a, tons of line, and he just went like a true I can't, spot. I can't remember if it was a no-look or he just, like, unloaded. But I just remember he just bounced it. Yeah. He he's got one of the mo- the purest arm swing mechanics. It looks it's so simple. It's just elbow here and then elbow here. He always hitting his peak. Incredible footwork. Even passing too. He's such a great passer. He yeah. does everything. It just looks so easy. Yeah. All right, we got a couple more questions, and I want to. We we could go all night, of course, but I know you got <laughs> yeah. some other things to do. You got always got a busy thing. That's good. Did we you agree? Jer- Germy asked, did you always want to be a libero growing up? I want to be a setter. I like setting. But the thing was, uh, I wasn't tall. I didn't jump high. And I wasn't good at setting. So, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I will, what I will do is I, I love playing four-man set. Four-man as a setter. Oh, I love that. That's You know that's what I've been watching a lot on YouTube? Um, I think it's in Vietnam. And they have this in Thailand, too. They play four-man outdoor. It's on like mud or uh-huh. clay or, oh man! And it, I mean they're throwing money. You see people throwing money on the side too, so you know about that. Oh, they have that. I got recruited one year to to play in one of these tournaments. It was, was it like a Hmong tournament. I, it was like one of these tournaments where it's like, uh, I think it's like Cambodian, but also like uh, like kind of like Mexican, and there's been got. I don't even know. I should, they're like it's like from what I know, like pretty illegal. And they were like, Hey man, we'll give you $4,000 to come play. And my <laughs> girlfriend was visiting from Finland. And I was just like, it's like, wow, that's a lot of money. Cause that was at the time when I was making like 12,000 a year. And I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. And that, but I was just like, you know what? Like, that's like the, I don't get in so much trouble. I'm with USA. And like, there's no chance I can do that. But like, I've heard like these crazy stories. I think Dalhauser played one. Like, oh man. <laughs> and I think he lost <laughs> because it's like this Cambodian style where guys are just like tossing balls. They serve quick. They can like lift balls. There's like no mm-hmm. rules and people just surround it. And it's just like, I don't know. It, look, it looks so much fun. Maybe one day I'll play in it. But for now, I'll play four man sand volleyball where <laughs> there's no money or whatever else on the line. <laughs> okay. Here's the Charles Strong 
Prima Prime Jiba versus Prime Clay Stanley. You know, I never really saw both. Uh, I love the way Jiba plays. I don't know Jiba as a person. I know Clay as a person. Clay is like the greatest guy ever. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go wash. I can't. I don't know what to say. I'll, I'll say Jiba Jiba and Clay on the same team as the All Star team. Yeah. Are you? What have you been doing for your own training to to stay in shape? Uh I've been working. Uh, I had this the homie. He was like a, one of the assistant coaches at Long Beach State when I was there. He's like five three Vietnamese uh, power lifter, and so uh, as like a side gig, he has this place in uh, Westminster mm-hmm. where it's just a bunch of uh, like a bunch of recycled like Olympic platforms, and so. He he lets he's been opening it up like one or two people most max at a time, so just working with him and just like uh, getting better with Olympic lifts. That's like the only physical stuff I'm doing right now. Uh, I just like tomorrow I'll go play some four man. But outside of that, wait if Sean Grubbs is still watching, come play some four man tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, but besides that, it's just like uh, just working on. Uh, you know, different opportunities, you know, different opportunities to serve, to be of value. And, uh, you know, when I can, you know, obviously meditating and trying to be intentional with my work. But I think now is the, the opportunity to, to give rather than to take and focus on myself. Yeah. And I think the reason why people have been so receptive to you and like willing to invite you and, and I'm sure for now going to be supporting all the, the products um, after Volvoker is just because you've given so much. So it's, it's easy for people to support that and see value. Thank you. Yeah. I was lucky. I have two parents as, as teachers or two teachers as parents. And so it's just so natural, um, just kind of following their lead. But uh, yeah, it's been really interesting because it's like, do I want to go continue into volley and like do some products and stuff like that? Will the community support me? And so it's kind of like a trial run, like, because my heart is always going to be in Bali and I'd love to stay in it, but maybe it's just not possible. And so it's yeah. been, uh, so far it's been a good response. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there's always the, the coaching route. Um, and I'm sure you'd be great in that. Yeah, we'll see. I have had a couple interesting propositions. Uh, also maybe, um, my agent kind of proposed, you know, to, to work with him. So that's kind of interesting too, because I believe right now with Americans, we don't really have great representation. If really any, the top, top, top guys. Yeah. They're going to have good representation because you know, it. like they're going to be working with only the best clubs. And, but I don't think there's a, a lot of strong character in this world right now. And with regards to agents, a lot of horror stories. And then it's just like, what do those Asians do when, you know, the ish kind of hits the fan and who are they going to side with? Usually it's the clubs. Yeah. And so it's, it's not something I'm really excited about, but I could possibly provide uh, a lot more value for Americans that, you know, aren't world-class players and are just like, they want to do it because it's fun and they just, they're taken advantage of. And it just happens yeah. to so many people. So, so many yeah. people. So that's that's kind of interesting too. We'll, we'll see. Do you know uh, Tim Kelly from Bring It Promotions? Mm. I, he doesn't work with any guys, does he? I think he's all women now. I or does so he? I I don't I haven't kept up with what he's been what he's been doing the last decade because when I in two thousand nine when I finished college I actually went to go to the fire sale, and he wasn't there but uh, Dave Niffin from Irvine. Okay. He, they are actually able to get me to, I was, I, I was absolutely the shortest guy outside hitter. I did the next, I was absolutely like six, five, but they didn't, they never put that past me. They, they supported that and they said, okay, we'll try to find you a good fit. So they actually found me two semi-pro offers um, in Sweden and then one other country. Oh, no I way. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was great because they, they took stats. They had, they had a, an hour or three hour window where all these uh, coaches came. And they actually mm-hmm. took stats for us. And I was one of the, I was like, there were 20 outside hitters. I was top top 10 in hitting efficiency and then top five in passing efficiency. 
So they tried to push me, of course, as the L2 if the club needed one, and they actually, two people got back to them. But I always appreciated that neither of them said, you're too short or don't even try, you should go libero. They just simply asked me, what do you want to play if you got a contract? It's like, I got to be as a hitter. I don't want to play libero. So, okay, we'll do our best. And that was yeah. that. And, and Dave Niffin, I mean, he's got his own underdog story. I don't know if you know about, about his story in playing professionally in Spain. No, I don't. Uh, I got to tell you real quick. So he opened up the tour with this. He, he and his wife were kind of in charge of managing this tour. Tim Kelly couldn't make it. Or I think he made it maybe for the first two days, and then he had to go support some of his other guys uh -huh. and some of the, the bigger contracts to make sure they're okay. Uh, but he said uh, he got a he was he played at Irvine, I think, and that was way you know that was before John Sprout took over. So they were like mm -hmm. a, a very low ranking school. So he he got scouted. Or he, he was able to get interest in Spain. So he flew out to Spain for a tryout slash pretty much he got the contract. And he is 6'2", 6'1". So he's mm -hmm. not sh super short. And the coach, the Spanish coach looked at him, looked at him and said, no, nah, we're not taking you. are too short. So <laughs> then he's like, what the heck? What do I do now? I already got my plane ticket. So he's scrambling. And then there just happened to be another team that was looking for a setter. So he huh. had a tryout with them. He made that team, and that team beat them to to win the the Spanish championship. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome? funny. That's so funny because Spanish setters are usually tiny. They're so uh -huh. tiny. Yeah, but they're good. Like, so I I just I think you know obviously he's he knows what it's like to be overlooked. So I really appreciate always appreciate him uh, making I, that effort. I, I've always heard really good things about Niff. What are some volleyball workouts you guys suggest for high school players to get better? So a pretty general question. Uh, I, I would say look at Reed, Reed Hall. He's the, the, the online trainer from Canada. Also does in-person yeah. training, but a lot yeah. of great material too. Yeah. Do you prefer old school volleyball rules or new rules, such as stepping on the line, letting the ball hit the net while serving? Uh, I think... I like the net rule and I like the court. I think any ways to prolong the rally. Okay. Ikeo623 asks for serve receive, getting the body right behind the ball or moving your platform to make the angle, which is the most effective way? It's a good question. So day seven in the passing course, um, the big thing is it's all about space, right? So it doesn't really matter if you get your body behind it. If your arms hit your body, and we're gonna, our hips are gonna open up and we lose our angle entirely. So you get our body behind it, great, but like we need to create space and then usually upon contact, we need to elongate the space. And so I like keeping the ball usually just a little bit off my left side of the body, just a little bit, maybe a little bit off my right side. If it's in the middle, fine, but we have to continue to create that space. So the big thing is, is space. We can pass balls outside here perfectly, but at what percentage, right? Maybe 10, 20 compared to here, we're like 80, 90. And so, uh, of course, we need to track because anything can happen last second. So if we're here and the ball moves, you know, what's our possibility? We're going to be able to react with balance and confidence. Ball has to tape, you know, and we're, we believe the ball is going to be here. How are we going to react if the ball's in front of us? And so, just being as balanced as possible uh, and being able to make that last second reaction, last second response to creating more space. Yeah. So would you say that's a higher priority than, and that could depend on people's, how fast their feet are, the length of the limbs. I guess there's a lot of physiological factors that would dictate a person's technique. So would you say space is the most important, um, 100%. I guess, focus? Okay. 100%. It's just contact, right? I mean, we can pass ball like this with one arm if we hit it in perfect contact. Because, mm -hmm. you know, here there's not going to be any space to, to collide. But it doesn't matter. You know, the, the one thing that I see consistently with great passers is there, there is no space that ruins the angle. Because when we lose the space, now we lose our hips. Something has to go, huh? There's so much force coming into our body. Our hips are going to open up. Same thing here. For me, I get, I get in a lot of trouble with high balls because I don't continue moving my feet back or falling. It's hard to fall back, and usually I fall to create that space, to keep the space back. But on high balls, you can't really fall back. So high balls, when I was making this passing course, and again, like I passed the best of my life after making this passing course because you just you watch so much volleyball that you understand like uh, 
what Janya is doing, what Satorsky is doing, what Eric's doing. And so, and I just absorb it by watching it subconsciously absorb it. So the big thing for me, and I, got, I started getting better at is high balls. When I passed, you know, there is some space, right? But once it hits it, boom, it opens up. And so what I started doing a lot more is I'd pass and keep on moving my feet back. Mm. And so space is, space is the only thing that matters, really. Of course, we want to be able to be prepared. I talk about being prepared, how we can prepare for our arms, our split step, working with individual arms so we can be quicker to get the ball outside of us so we can have more space to work with initially, uh, different ways we can move. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about space. And that's really the only thing that matters, space. And if we want to do it consistently, we need to move well and be balanced upon contact so if something does happen we can be limber and flexible for our hips to open up with that last minute adjustment to maintain yeah. good spacing got it and it's not going to be every ball but there's going to be a lot of balls we'll have to adjust last second so you see the best liberos are in a position where they can move somehow maybe it's their hips maybe it's their foot maybe it's their whole feet maybe it's their body and rather, you know, say like 10 balls, it's like two balls, you have to make that last second adjustment. So it's a big difference of like passing 60% positive or passing 50% positive. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great tidbit to end on. Thanks for that technique uh, tidbit. I think that's, it clears up for a lot of people because there's always that debate of, do I pass midline? Do I pass off center? Do I set the angle first? Do I step back? But as long as like, maintaining good space will is the the most important aspect so that, that's great absolutely so thanks a lot just uh dustin for having another great volleyball talk and just yeah. taking time out of your day i know you're a busy schedule you're, you're really great at just being productive and maximizing um who you are and and what you do if you want to reach out to dustin you can hit him up on his instagram at dustin watton or his underscore just Dustin one easy this one okay I'll include the link anyway in, in the description box. And also he's got some great online courses that you can check out. Is it on, going to be on a website as well? Yeah, I have it. Have, have I sent you one? I'll send you one. I don't think okay. I have though. I don't, I haven't received it anything I'll, yet, but I'll give you, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a promo code to get it for free, the passing course. And then when the dig course comes out too, I'll get you that. Oh so man, you can keep that'd be balling. awesome. I could also always use better passing. I mean, and send me uh, send me your address. I'll get you a shirt. I'll just throw you a shirt too. Okay, appreciate that. I want to rep the the no easy buckets lifestyle. <laughs> All day, baby. Yeah, <laughs> we gotta get the like no no easy pho, like you know only spicy pho. <laughs> no no bland pho. <laughs> oh man. I, I can't put you know people always put sauces and all that stuff. It's like I gotta I, I gotta have the natural broth flavor i don't know about oh, you are you really? a sauce guy yeah do you, do you I put mean, sauces there at first i wasn't i like my two best friends one was uh cambodian and one was uh indonesian and african-american mm. and uh man they teased me so much they're like hey white boy like put some sauce in your phone i'm like no i like <laughs> it it's fine <laughs> but now i love the sauce yeah i like to mix it okay. up okay maybe maybe you can sauce my bus so i can see what a, a well sauce pho tastes like <laughs> i'll make you cry <laughs> I'm so bad in the worst. <laughs> cool. All right, Dustin. Always good hanging out and chatting up. Uh, take care of yourself. Thank you, my brother. Great talking to you, and hopefully we will see each other in person soon. All right, for sure. Take care. All right, see All you. Right.